Thank you for that introduction, Graeme. Uh, tonight, it, according to Graeme, what he just said is a dip. So, you know, there's a dip in standards, I guess, a dip in whatever it is. <laughs> but uh, don't worry, we'll go back up again soon. Um, Graeme will come back. Graeme Davis and uh, Ron Bailey, I believe, also. So just uh, bear with me for this evening. Um, I've been doing some studies with the Exit, uh, with the Rora Fellowship, uh, as you know, and I, I've been going through the Book of Exodus. And over recent weeks, so uh, in our great journey of the people of God out of bondage, um, we we've reached Mount Sinai, and uh, that's made a, a provoked a lot of thoughts in my own heart. And uh, as I've looked at it, and I, of course, I I love the parallel with the New Testament. That's where I'm going tonight. I'm going into Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. When you get to Mount Sinai, they go up Mount Sinai. Moses went up Mount Sinai, and um, uh, then God came down and spoke the Ten Commandments. I don't know whether people were uh, in the crowd when God spoke those Ten Commandments who were tempted or even living in adultery or planning murder or lying probably the great word of god sp spoken from that mountain um, by god without an intermediary uh, probably shook the people to the root of their beings and the whole experience was one of exclusion no one was allowed to approach god and uh uh, the top of the mountain was blocked off, even around the base of the mountain, no one could approach. And uh, this was, in, in some ways, it was already a foreshadowing of the tabernacle. There was God coming to live among the people, but God not accessible. So when we get to the um, uh, Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, we're really seeing a parallel of that event. And uh, in Matthew chapter 5, we have this, what well, could be, I've not measured it, the longest sermon that Jesus ever preached. I'm sure it was certainly longer than the three short chapters we have. Uh, and it was an introduction. Of course, the, the thing is, let's read a few verses, but let's just be struck immediately in the first opening words of the huge contrast that Moses went alone up and down the mountain to get uh, information from God and uh, revelation and fellowship with God. But here in chapter five, Jesus takes the multitudes with him. Let's read some of it. And verse one, seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. I noticed that already, that distinction that the multitudes came at the base of the, at the beginning, but then as he went up, the crowd thinned out because people weren't wanting the rigors of a climb. They didn't want maybe to miss their lunch, whatever it was. Simple things like that can uh, show who is a true disciple. Oh, it's too much trouble. Oh, the sermon was too long. Oh, I don't like the music. Oh, I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. Where is the, the, the vigor, the, the willingness to embrace uh, the love of others and preferring others? Um, his disciples come to him. It says here, and his disciples came to him. So he went up that mountain. He strode off and climbed the mountain. And his disciples persevered and walked with him through the hardship. And it isn't a physical marathon we're running, it's a spiritual marathon. And the thing that will thin, thin out our, uh, uh, and separate people is in the end, whether we will keep praising him, not, not our physical muscles, but our spiritual muscles, whether we'll keep praising him, keep trusting him, keep affirming our belief that he is good and he is love and he has great plans for us. And the disciples went up with him. 
This chapter five is in strong contrast with Luke's gospel chapter six, because it's the same sermon. It's a great comfort for any preacher to notice that Jesus preached the same sermon more than once, um, because I'm afraid I only preach the same sermon. I've only got about three sermons, but so far not many people have noticed that. But uh, the point is, the point is we, we have very few things, but here we notice here that Jesus is preaching the same sermon, but you notice a hugely different application. And in Luke's gospel, chapter six, he's on the plain. He's not climbed a mountain. And the multitudes are still there. And there on the plain, there are whole elements to his talk there that are absent here in Matthew chapter five, six and seven. And those elements that are absent, one of them is this word woe, woe to you who laugh, woe to you that are full, and so on. So we're, we're seeing here Jesus going up the mountain and he's got the disciples with him. His disciples came to him and he taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And so we've got these, these beatitudes uh, at the beginning of the Sermon in the, of the Mount, on the Mount, and the, the beatitudes are keys, principles, they're steps which people take into the kingdom of God, and these steps, these principles actually stand at the door of all his teaching. Whichever part of his teaching you take, you can put this first. And at any situation, you know, whether you look at, want to apply the teaching of Jesus to marriage, for example, these will apply. And uh, there's keys here that will unlock every situation. And uh, we, we thank God for such a direct, clear, um, and simple uh, opening of a door for people to get so close to God. And that is the, the great goal of this teaching. In the Mount Sinai, the... Um, the, the, the law was coming from the outside. It was coming uh, as something, as a legalistic thing. If you do this, that's a sign of your holiness. You don't do that. You don't listen to that kind of music. That's, that's not holiness. You don't wear that kind of thing. That's, that's, that's not holiness. This is holiness. You wear this kind of thing. You listen to that kind of thing. And all these kinds of things are, in, in the end, ridiculous in the New Testament, because it's not about dressing our lives like a Christmas tree with things that are dead, but it's about a living inner connection with Jesus Christ, with all that it is, all the power of the law is now written on the hearts of believers. And that's what you get by this verse Eight, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This is the goal of those beatitudes. It is purity of heart. It is God inscribing his law on our hearts. 
And uh, if you think about it, when you think about writing the Ten Commandments on my heart or on your heart, of course, you have to surrender to God as God to do this. It's the first commandment. God says, I'm going to write the first commandment and it's going to be you shall have no other gods. I'm going to demolish all the other things in your life that compete with God. And if at that point we say, no, I want to keep this one and I want to keep that avenue, God says, okay, then all the others are not going to be written. You can't overcome sexual sin. You can't overcome lusts and covetousness. You can't overcome anger. You can't overcome these things by an external law. You can restrain those things. You can direct your life in a certain direction. But if God is going to write his law on your heart, my heart, then I must first surrender to him and say, be God in my life. Be first in my life. Be the center of my life. Be the power of my life. And write your will, your law on my heart. And of course, then I'm embracing everything he says about morality and so on, about spirituality. There's, there's great um, debates in some Christian circles about morality. And some of those debates actually indicate that um, people have not embraced God as God. His, his, this is a God-based miracle, just as the law is God-based. Take God out of the mix and you've, got, you've lost the authority, you've lost the plumb line, you've lost the center, you've lost the heart, you've lost, the, you've lost everything and you've started on another, another on a wholly different thing. I mean, I, I read someone, uh, someone's uh, version of the Ten Commandments. Once you've taken God out, what have you got left? Well, in their Ten Commandments, they, they, they started with things like the planet Earth. And the need to guard the planet Earth and the environment and the uh, and so on and uh, and the problem of extinction and uh, global warming and all these things, all things that are gr quite rightly being addressed by politicians now, but um, they're not the Ten Commandments. The first is the key one, and we're coming to the Lord and saying, "Right, on my heart." your standards, your law, your holiness. Of course, holiness is um, the fruit of God's presence in my life. And wherever people neglect God as first and neglect worship, and wherever that is somehow fading or dislodged, then other things come back in and, and, and other problems come. And uh, you can look at the sins of David, when David br um, broke the law so many times, he committed adultery, he lied, he blasphemed, he took the name of the Lord in, in vain, he, he murdered somebody, and so on, all these things. But those were all because in, his, in the center of his being, he had neglected his relationship with God. And those things then crowded in, they came in. So we, we'll come back to the Beatitudes in a moment, this thing of a pure heart. And, and this is God's great question. It's God's great miracle. It's the center of the new covenant. It's the power of Pentecost. If you want to ask what Pentecost is about, it is about creating in a person a clean heart. That's what Pentecost is about. If we were to sum it up in a phrase, that's what it is. It's changing the person at the core of their being. And uh, that's why we, we desperately need that, to be, to be New Testament, New Covenant people. And the New Covenant began, the law was written on people's hearts there in Acts chapter 2, when God came down and as though to those people who were surrendering their lives to him, he came in and wrote his law, inscribed it by his finger on the tables of their hearts, making them pure at the core of their being. Now, I say we'll come back to the Beatitudes in a moment. But when we move on to 
the 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 broad outline of the the Sermon on the Mount, you, you'll know that um, in chapter um, five, uh, from verse thirteen to the end, he's talking about moral excellence. We could say holiness. He's talking about purity worked out in life, and of course, this is his. This is what he wants for us. Now, the main areas of, of excellence, moral excellence and purity are these. Just notice them. And the first one is in verse 21. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. Quite simple. But Jesus says, verse 22, but he says, I say to you. And when he's saying but, he's not saying that Moses didn't get it quite right or that the Ten Commandments were somehow off, not, not really the, the point. He was saying, he was really saying, but I say to you, you must apply this correctly. This isn't just about the action. It's about the thing that makes the action come. And he says, uh, whoever is... Uh, angry without a cause with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment whoever says to his brother raka fool shall be in danger of the council but whoever says you fool shall be in danger raka means worthless one whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire strong words and he points out here the cause of all these, the cause of murder is anger. He's saying there are many people who uh, are, have got anger issues. They're frustrated in themselves. Of course, again, you come back to this, this thing of, uh, of relationships, people getting angry with one another, people getting frustrated, impatient. And he's saying that's, that's, that's murder. Before God, that's murder. And um, he talks about the need to be reconciled and to get these things sorted. The second area, of course, is adultery. He says the same thing. And when I read these words of Jesus, they are so direct, so artlessly simple. Saying to a person, I, he says, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, whoever looks at a woman, of course, he's talking about a, a person you see. Of course, then you've got all the, the, the avenue of the eyes and the way people indulge in this. He says that person who's looking has committed adultery with her already in his heart. He's talking about the heart. He says this isn't about outward things. This is about inward things. This is about the state of the heart. And then he goes on on that, ish, on that line. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Cast it from you, for it is more profitable that one of your members perish than that your whole body be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish then that your whole body be cast into hell. We know from our study in Revelation that hell is a place where people go bodily. That's a shock. They're raised from the dead and sent there bodily. But here he says it would be better to go through life maimed uh, than to, you know, to have all the all our all our limbs and everything, and yet go to hell. He's not saying and Christians have never maimed themselves. They've never plucked out their eyes or cut off their hands and feet, all those things. No, but he's, he's simply saying, if that could save you from hell, it would be worth it. That would be a price worth paying. Of course, it, it can't save you from hell. There is an operation that God does on the heart. And he's saying, if you want this radical, 
inner heart surgery from God, you've got to realize what God is talking about. God is not talking about just feeling a bit better. God isn't just talking about having a nicer kind of a, you know, nice sweet feeling here and there. He's talking about the radical issues of, of humanity. The greatest uh, challenge is really a moral challenge, moral excellence. And this is what the Bible challenges, challenges us to, and it's challenged challenges right through the whole of scripture god never changes or varies and you get right through to the first letter of peter be ye holy for i am holy says the lord then it goes on to talk about um, oaths and lying these great areas um he's talking about the potentially these these terrible things are in every person and we need the grace of god to set us free at a heart level then he goes on in the end of the chapter to talk about the positive side of holiness which is love holiness without love would be a a cold thing holiness without love would be a a dead thing and uh, it would be it would have the cold light i mean it would be it would be like a sun that would never warm you or it would be dreadful holiness must be tinged with it must be illuminated fired by the wonder of love and he's say, saying this because holiness is not a, about negatives only of course there are things we must overcome but it's about a great positive the, the the love of God is poured out in our hearts and we can be filled with the love of God. A pure heart is not a static, cold thing without something. It's something that is fired by the warmth of God's love. And that's the, 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 the context, if you like. He's saying this kingdom is going to be a kingdom of, of, of moral power from the heart. I'm going to write these laws on your heart. When you get to chapter six, he's now talking about spiritual excellence. When you look at the uh, law of Moses and um, um, Andy Deville, I can see he's not got his picture on tonight, but Andy Deville asked me if I would speak on the the the, the um, Levitical sacrifices, and uh, I thought, oh dear, I don't think I I'm not. That would take a lot of preparation. I'm not really ready to uh, to preach on that. But um, in a way, we're doing that in a, in a more overview kind of way. Because as the law goes on, it ta then talks about the tabernacle. And the, uh, the, whole the whole spiritual heart of Israel, fellowship with God. And in chapter 6, he talks about the spiritual excellence of the kingdom. We want moral excellence but of course we need spiritual excellence and uh, we're not going to talk about prayer any any more than to say that the the chapter six simply says the way is open for heart union and communion and fellowship with god in the holy spirit that's the message of chapter six he says go into the secret place if you put this in the context of the law of moses there you've got the tabernacle built you've got the holy of holies nobody's allowed in there except we're high priest once a year and now jesus comes and stands out there and says now go in just go in just go in and have a look and uh, you can hear the, the priest saying no i can't go in there i'll die and jesus says go in how could he say that because of course he's saying it in the light of the cross which will tear the veil and make the way wide open for heart fellowship and communion with god in the holy spirit i think for me one of the most beautiful phrases in the new testament is is the the fellowship of the holy spirit the communion of the holy spirit and the the whole realm of sitting with god in peace of heart and quietness of inner life and 
being at, at ease with yourself, at ease in your, in, with, with, with God and sitting there and without intensity or pressure, just to sit there in wonder at the beauty and the fragrance that comes from the, from the person of God, Christ, in us. And this is the, the wonder of chapter six, that our hearts become the Holy of Holies. Our hearts become the Ark of the Covenant. We become a portable, if you like, chair for God. We become the place where he puts his law, the place where he's put his presence. It's astonishing, these claims, isn't it? that now we are the tabernacle, we are the Holy Fathers. Of course, if we were inventing this, we would be, uh, we'd feel, how dare we? But of course, we're only quoting what the apostle said. You are the temple of the living God. You, your body is the temple of God, of the Holy Spirit. And that word temple is, is the referring to the inner sanctuary of the Holy of holies and that's chapter six and uh, so that, that's uh, let's just move on to chapter seven you and we, we we see we've got moral excellence we've got um spiritual excellence and we've got then in chapter seven we've got um a life that is ready to stand the storms and in chapter 7, you'll notice storms are coming at the end, right at the end. It says in verse um, 24, uh, a person who does what I'm saying, who pers a person who is building their life, not on adherence to outward things, but adhering to an inward relationship with Jesus Christ. This is the center and heart of what you are. And you're obeying him. And because you're obeying him, look what he says. Therefore, who hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And then comes the floods. And then comes the rain, the floods, the winds. And, and it doesn't fall because it was founded on the rock. But whoever hears these sayings and does not do them is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and then the floods came and swept it away. And so in chapter seven, you, we're seeing this, this uh, uh, the life that is built and is um, strengthened from the inside and this life that is building relationship, heart relationship with, with, with the, the Lord. And we see this way, it's a life that will stand through the storms of life and ultimately through the storms that will come, the storms of, the, uh, of judgment day and all those things, the life will stand. What is the power of a life that stands? It's there in chapter 7, verse 23. It's put here negatively. Uh, he talks about people who are who are not getting to getting letting the Lord into their inner life. They're not they're not building this. Not, the Lord hasn't been writing on their hearts. They've just got involved in things outwardly. And the things he says here are quite astonishing. He says, many will say to me in that Lord, they Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And Jesus seems to dismiss that and say, well, that's. That's wonderful, I'm sure he would say, because he sent them out to do that. But he, he says, that's not the center of the kingdom. The center of the kingdom is this. I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawless, lawlessness. The center of the kingdom is this, that God knows me. I know God. You see, when I, when I sum up the prophets who talk about the, the, the coming of the Holy Spirit, he, they put it like this, I will write my law on their hearts and they shall no longer say, 
know the Lord to one another, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest, that the, the people of God who've come into this place with me, they will know me. They will be my friends. They will have this mark that they fellowship with me. They love me. They walk with me. And uh, so when we, when we sum up the challenge of these chapters, let's, uh, we're going to go back to the beginning of the chapter to the, uh, of the Sermon on the Mount in a moment. But let's just, before we do, let's sum up the, the, the challenge of these chapters. Quite simply, it is this. Are you pure in heart? Do you have a knowledge of the inner place of fellowship and communion? That's moral, that's spiritual. Do you know him? Is there a place in your life that is so such a treasure, such a, a fragrance, such a the center of all that you are? That's the place you go back to again and again. The anchor of a Christian is that I know him and he knows me. It's my, my own secret place of knowing Jesus. And of all the things that, you know, that let not the rich man glory in his wealth, not the wise man glory in his knowledge, in, his, in all his wisdom and all those things, but let him that glorieth, glory in this, that he knows and understands me, that I am the Lord. And that's the knowledge of the Lord is worth everything. It's more than rubies. It's more than diamonds. It's if you gave if you gave everything you had, the knowledge of the Lord to sit with the Lord in in sweet communion and fellowship is worth everything. It was Spurgeon who said, "If God has called you to be a preacher, why would you stoop to be a king?" It's interesting if you're a preacher, but I would put it differently and say, if God has called you to sit with Jesus and know him, why would you stoop to do anything else uh, that would compete with that or allow anything in your life that would cloud it or block it and stop it? The only thing worth living for is to prepare my heart to be the place where God is writing his law, and I am being this inner sanctuary for him to dwell. It's the challenge of these, of these chapters. Let's go back now to the, just for a few moments, to chapter five, and let's look at the, the, the steps in, because the challenge is so great, but then what is the way in? The answer is, well, let's look at it, verse three, Here's Jesus starting off. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Mm -hmm. the, the bankrupt. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And uh, I can imagine, I can remember looking at bankrupt people, spiritually bankrupt people. I remember one person I looked at, I can remember two. One was a bank manager. Saw him in Cameroon lying in the dust, drunk, and uh, unable to move, and people looking at him, pointing their finger at him, he was, he was legless, <laughs> he was lying in the dirt, he was bankrupt. But was he blessed? Hmm. Blessed are those of the poor in spirit. And the, the other one was in, um, in the streets of Moscow, again, a man unable to move what had gone through his veins and his body i don't know what despair what heartache what damage through his parents i don't know you look you think of people um you can see who are in desperate need of jesus christ and i can think of thousands you see them all the time you see them often when you if there's a, a video of or um, uh, an advert for famine in Ethiopia, or the refugees in Syria, or villages that are being bombed in Yemen, or places without war. You see people who are bankrupt, and they're crying out. 
That's why they risk their lives to cross the Mediterranean to get to Italy. That's why they go over the channel. They're desperate. And Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. But of course, many of those people that I've mentioned, many of them would never say, never start praying. That's the last thing they do, a prayer. No, I don't want to pray. But this statement is a great cry of a heart. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. And some people have not been helped. Not yet. They haven't got this help of the Sermon on the Mount because they haven't needed Jesus enough. You know, you wonder sometimes why does God allow things? And I think you, you look at the way he led them in the wilderness and they were, went through uh, hunger and thirst, but then he provided for them. Why was that? Why does God lead people through wilderness? Why does God allow things in lives? It's to to write something in our lives and say you need me don't you you need can you say it? see it can you say it can you i need you jesus i need you in my personal life i haven't got the peace of god i need you in my marriage i need you in and so on i need we say i said you can put this at the basis of everything that jesus does in your life i need you in my prayer life i need you in my bible reading i can't do this without you lord what you can do without the Lord is, 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 uh, is just a mirage. You can't. I need you, Jesus. And then the second one, blessed are those who mourn. Going to a funeral. What's the funeral? And you've heard me mention this fact before that Watchman Nee used to, uh, on occasions, I think it was only one occasion, he put a coffin in the front of the church and people thought who had died because they had open coffins there and they could see the body. And um, he put a mirror in the coffin. And there you are, you blessed those who mourn. Whose funeral is it? It's yours. It's mine. But what are we talking about here? The funeral of what? The funeral of the wasted hours days, years, the wasted years of living without depending on him. They're gone now. Thank God we, 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 we lament those years, but as we come here and we draw a line in the sand, that's over. The waste is gone. And a new day is beginning. And the new day is the day of, uh, he says, I will restore to you the wasted years. I will restore to you what the the locust has eaten. I will just, just all the wasted years. That that that's the funeral. That's buried. It's gone. The waste is gone, and now a new day has come, of usefulness, of profitableness. It's going to change. Blessed are the meek. You become as gentle as the lamb, and uh, and, and and as teachable as a lamb. Uh, it's it's interesting. That one of the great marks of a disciple, the word disciple really means a pupil. It means an apprentice. And uh, we never stop being disciples. The great word in the Bible for believers is apprentices. We are apprentices. We're learners. As, as believers, we've got a big L sticker on our car. <laughs> and we never, we never progress. We're learners. But the point is to learn, you've got to be like a, a child, you know, have you ever, I mean, I remember, I'm sure we've all said this. I've known that for years. Have you ever said, I must have said that loads of times. I've always known that. Of course, I've never, everything I know, I've been taught. I've learned it. Paul says, what do you have that you did not receive? Did you, did you invent it? Now it was given to us, given to us by God, given to us through people, given to us. We learn, we're meek, we're teachable. Teach me, Lord, I need. And he, and he is teachable. And then it says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And here's this hunger for the Holy Spirit 
because that's what he's talking about here in this kingdom of god he's talking about what's going to come on the day of pentecost he says blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness if we hunger for the holy spirit but don't hunger for purity of heart if we're not hung hungering for that what are we hungering for is it some feeling is it some experience is it some what are we hungering for here he says thirst thirst for righteousness and uh, jesus often talks about that thirst that thirst if any man thirst let him come to me and out of him shall flow rivers of living water thirsty to be righteous and um, when you then it goes on to uh, verse seven blessed blessed are the merciful because you suddenly lose all your condemnation of others you you stop looking down on others thinking wow i i am i'm so i'm so weak everything i do is hell is through the help of god how could I ever condemn a person again? And then we come to verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I love that verse. And of course, it's, it's a big thing to say, I have a pure heart. Isn't that a huge thing to say? And I guess we all would, would say that with the... With, uh, fear and trembling we would say i have a pure heart god has washed me inside and um, it, it isn't something you that we can um, kind of boast about oh i've made myself pure i've done all this no god says i will i will i will go to the very heart and center of who you are and i'll make you clean it says here they shall see god and of course it, it, there is that sense in which when we get to heaven, we shall see him. And that's the promise. But it's also the promise now. We shall see him in our circumstances. We shall, we shall be aware of him in our lives. We shan't think he's not there. And uh, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about the, um, uh, the dirty windows. If you've ever been to, I remember um, a, a garage it was just down the road from where my brother where i lived in derbyshire as a boy we lived there and uh, as boys we once went and saw this old garage and the windows were so dirty there were windows all along the side of this garage and we went up there as old it was so ancient it was wooden walls and falling apart and uh, it was dilapidated and we went up and we could hardly see through the window and we it was so dirty and then trying to clean it a bit and there we looked inside and to our amazement was a vintage car probably worth hundreds of thousands today i guess it was an old vintage car uh, it looked like a rolls royce looking through there I, I don't know what it was but you know you couldn't see the treasure nobody knew what was there i had certainly no idea when well, we just got a little i could see inside but when when we try and see the glory of God, of course, we need to be washed to see the beauties of Jesus Christ. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. They shall be aware of God. They shall know the beauty of him. They shall be, they shall be so captivated by how wonderful it is. I was just reading today a verse in John chapter 7. When they, they, they'd sent people to arrest Jesus, they'd sent the, um, the, the, the temple guard to go and arrest Jesus, and they'd got there, and they hadn't been able to arrest him. They couldn't touch him. And they came back to the, um, to the, to the Sanhedrin, they came back to the high priest, and they said, what is, what, 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 where is he? And they said, Never man spoke like this man. We never heard it like this before. Never seen anything like this. And that wonder, when people saw a glimpse into the wonder of Jesus. Of course, the wonder of a pure heart is that you see the beauty of Christ. 
but it's not just the beauty of Christ. It's the beauty of Christ in you. Christ in me. You see that glorious one, that resplendent one, that shining one. He's here. And the, the whole uh, gospel is revealed in this phrase. The, 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 the light of the glory of God has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of Jesus Christ in in us it's this beauty and it says that we all with our open face beholding the beauty of the lord is in a glass it says and the glass is in a glass darkly because it wasn't a dirty window but it's just a a picture of the kind of mirror they had that wasn't as like mirrors. it was kind of a um the mirrors that he's referring to is a kind of a bronze mirror that doesn't have that sharp when we fellowship with the lord we don't see there's still uh, limits to our fellowship we still see darkly it says we know in part yeah. but we're perceiving mm -hmm. blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see god mm -hmm. why do we seek god why do we spend time in prayer why do we stir ourselves up to to go after him why because we want to to see him to know him mm -hmm. to fellowship with him to catch, capture this fellowship of the Holy Spirit. What came down on the day of Pentecost? What is underlying all these chapters is the miracle of a life united in intimate heart fellowship with Jesus Christ. It's the secret. It's the power of a life. Well, it goes on to say, then you become a peacemaker, not a troublemaker. Um, you know, if, if I turned up and somebody was said, oh, here comes trouble. Uh, why? Why would they say that? Maybe because, oh, he's got those strong views on this. I could probably mention a few strong views that people have got that might upset somebody. Oh, he's going to come and divide us all. He's going to start talking about that again. Oh, he's going to start talking about politics. Oh, he's going to start talking about Oh, you know, he's pre-trib or he's post-trib rapture. Oh, he's this and here comes trouble. Oh, we're going to hear it again. All these trouble. I don't want to be a troublemaker unless it's because I challenge people to the gospel and to the truth of the gospel. But peacemakers, bringing peace, bringing the gospel, bringing the light of Christ. And then he gets, says, you, you do get into trouble because you can't avoid it if you live in Christ. They'll persecute you. Anybody who lives righteously in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution of some kind, whether it's mockery, the cold shoulder. I don't want to see you. I don't want to talk to you. Or whether it be the worst persecution of some countries. But the heart and center of this whole thing, I hope I've communicated it a little, a little bit, is the wonder of Jesus. Oh, Lord, I want to know you. I need you, Lord. I need you in my life. I don't want to waste my life. I don't want a day to go by where I haven't bowed my knees and made you Lord and God in my life. Remember the first commandment, you shall have no other gods. That's where it all flows from. Let's pray, shall we? Let's pray. Let's pray. Mm. Jesus, I love you. Mm. Jesus, I need you. Every hour I need you. Every morning when I open my eyes, I need you. Everything. And yet it's not through striving. It's just simply resting and acknowledging I have just simply to come and let you minister this beautiful place fresh in my heart and empower me to live in a way that glorifies you. I want to be the light of the world, not by anything else other than that I've, I'm attending to the you inside me. That you be the light, the joy of me, the wonder of what I am, the power that I seek, that I need yeah. in it, to overcome anything that's that's, that's wrong oh jesus you're beautiful and i surrender fresh to you in jesus wonderful name amen amen
Amen. Open it up for prayer. If anyone wants to pray,